Hello, my dark darlings. I'm Markia, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. To our veteran listeners and those voyaging into the dark with us for the first time, welcome. Most of my family is what you would call average height to short. I'm the tall female in it, standing at a very towering five foot five. So for me, whenever I see in movies where you have a giant blob or a Godzilla type of a character, that immense height is unfathomable to me and is more than a little scary. Because what is that beyond the trees, along the wall, stretched out along the ground, lurking, waiting? From further away, towering figures can look small and slow, but in an instant they're upon you, and then it's too late. First, a boy cries monster, and the monster responds. Next, a shared pain sits in a shared silence. After that, a cavalcade of sound hunts us in Japan. And finally, a morning breakfast, best served with children. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week. As always, the first story you hear is one that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com snarled. Then, I read a few more stories for the podcast. If you have a tale you're dying to share, send me an email at somethingscary@snarled.com. And if you'd like to support the show and receive bonus content, consider joining our Patreon. Our patrons play a huge role in keeping the show running every single week. For more information on how you can help the show and also be a part of it, visit patreon.com slash snarled. So, want to hear something scary? The Monster Who Mocks We all know the story of the boy who cried wolf. It's an old warning to be wary of calling monsters out, for once you call them, you might not be able to control them while they're there. Since I was a kid, I've always been a prankster. Not small, momentary gags. I specialized in long, intricate, slow-burning pranks that would drive someone to the brink of madness before finally revealing the lie. Tormenting people was my favorite hobby, which is why my parents sent me to a boot camp for troubled teens. Rigid schedules, strict discipline, intense drills. It was supposed to help me, but it was obvious from the start that the instructors loved tormenting us kids. This place couldn't possibly be sanctioned. We were prisoners. I needed out. So I hatched my greatest prank yet to be free of this place. Breaking into the comms building of this sham of a military boot camp was easy. Turning on the PA system, even easier. Using my most inhumane voice, spewing guttural sounds from my throat, I thundered. I will rip you all apart. From the comms window, I saw confused kids stopping their torturous drills. The head drill instructor spun around in surprise and tripped on his face. My laughter boomed out of the speakers. The furious look on his face was priceless. Come and get me. I baited. My discipline was swift and harsh. I'll just say that the nicest part of it was having to sprint obstacle courses all throughout the night. While I was out there, on the far end of the obstacle course, away from the instructor minding me, I heard something. An inhuman screech that sliced through the air. It sounded like the perfect mimic of the noises I made earlier. At the tree line, I saw it. A blank-faced creature with sharp claws and an open mouth, a smirk twitching its face. In the blink of an eye, it was right in front of me, towering over me, teeth gleaming, drool dripping onto my face, hunching over, limbs bent at odd angles. It reached out, held my face as it spoke to me. I've been watching you. I'll help you because you'll help me. Nodding in agreement slowly, afraid for my life, I didn't know what it meant, but I'd give it anything to go away. Then it started changing. It shrank, body parts shifting into a human form. When it was finally done, it was as if I was staring in a mirror. It looked exactly like me. It mimicked my voice perfectly. I'll help you get what we both want. 
striding back into the forest, wearing my face, it disappeared into the trees. The instructor ran up to me then, blaming me for the screeching noise and doubled my punishment. All the next day, I was in my bunk, recovering from yesterday's torment. Weirdly enough though, the day after that, kids were looking at me distrustfully. A series of deadly pranks were happening around the boot camp. A collapsing obstacle course, snapped ropes, and so on and so on. And every day, somehow, my screech would sound over the PA system. I wasn't doing it, but nobody believed me. Would you? I barely believed me. And it kept happening, day after day. That screech would echo, the pranks would happen, and I would be punished all over again. My life was becoming a living nightmare. I was being punished, ridiculed, no one trusted me. It was the mimic though, and I had to escape. I waited until the next time I heard that screech. This time, it was during lights out. I grabbed a hatchet and snuck out of the boot camp. My flashlight scanned the dark forest as I ran, light flitting across the trees, and suddenly spotlighted my own face staring back at me. It was the mimic. It raced towards me and everything went black. When I woke up, the sun was shining. I was still in the woods and I was alone. There was no sign of the shapeshifter. But there was the sound of a building collapsing and people screaming. In the sky, I could see great clouds of smoke. I stumbled through the woods to get back, but the boot camp for troubled teens was already gone. Crumbling, exploding, ablaze, nothing was spared. As I ran through the gates, wounded instructors hid behind their hands and kids fled away from me for their lives, growing more terrified when they saw my face. Please don't eat us, they begged. Monster, they cried. I was too stunned to speak. It wasn't me. It was the thing that it used my face. I'll help you get what we both want, it had said. It felt like I was the mark in one of my own pranks. The shapeshifter burst out of the wreckage, but this time, as it rose from the rumble, a hulking, bloody menagerie of different body parts, all mimicked from its devoured victims. Licking its chops, it said, I'd been starving for so long. And now we're both free. Striding past me, it vanished into the woods, leaving me behind in the wreckage that it had left. How often do you think about your socks? If you're like I used to be, not much. But I recently discovered socks that changed the way I'll think about socks forever. They're called Bombas. I really enjoy the quality of Bombas and that they come in a variety of sock lengths and styles. Because I've been running more, I'm really enjoying the performance ankle socks right now. They breathe well, they're super soft, and are so very comfortable. Along with pampering my poor little arches, they legit look really good with my sneakers. And yeah, that's kind of important to me. So I'll be getting some more Bombas actually, but I'm going to exclusively use those for my boots because Bombas are what feet daydream about. Buy your Bombas at bombas.com slash scary today and get 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash scary for 20% off. Bombas.com slash scary. Being sick is the worst. We can feel very alone in our misery. Well... In this story inspired by Luna Rose, we wish that we were alone while we lie hurting in the dark. Scratchy, throbbing. My throat felt so horrible night after night ever since my family moved into this new house. As soon as I'd lay down to sleep, it would be hard to breathe and hard to swallow. The doctors couldn't find any signs of infection, so they chalked it up to allergies from moving from another state. I was given allergy medication, but it didn't really work, and I hadn't had a good night's rest in days. And when I did manage to get some shut-eye, I kept dreaming about hands clutching my throat. I could never see who it was, but it felt as if someone was choking me in my sleep. After a particularly disturbing nightmare, I got up to get some water felt like my energy was drained. 
My parents were snoring in their room as I crept into the kitchen. In the dark, I grabbed a mug and turned on the faucet to pour myself some water. There, in the reflection of the faucet, I saw someone behind me. Mom? I whispered hoarsely. Glancing over my shoulder, I froze, and I caught a sight of her, a crane-necked woman. The top of her head brushed the ceiling as she was hunched over. Her neck stretched grotesquely through her collar up to her head, veins popping out of the sides. She reached toward me. Dropping my mug, I screamed, wrecking my throat in pain. My parents ran in. Nancy, are you okay? The light flickered. The crane-necked woman was gone. There was no way for me to communicate to them, to fully explain. My throat felt so raw. I texted them what I saw. You are just tired, Nancy, my dad said as they put me back in bed, setting me up higher in my pillows. We'll check to see that everything's okay, just in case it wasn't a dream. My mother humored me as my eyes fluttered closed. The pain wasn't as bad when I sat up and fell asleep. At some point in the night, I must have slid down onto my back because a fiery hot ache caught in my throat. Coughing, I jolted myself awake in a fit. It wouldn't stop. And then I saw her. Outside my doorway, neck craning around the side. I saw the crane neck woman looking at me, Her eyes were all white and moving backwards as if she was floating. And she floated back towards the living room. Where were my parents, I wondered, as fear began to grow inside of me. Jumping out of bed, I raced to their room. There was no one there. I tiptoed down the hall to the living room, where I tripped on something, something warm. I looked down. It was my mother and father. They were unconscious on the floor of the living room. The hot pain prickled up my throat again, as if I was being stung from the inside, clutching my throat. I winced, and as I looked up, the crane-necked woman had her hands around my parents' throat, pulling their warmth and their energy from them. Did you do this? I snapped hoarsely. The crane-necked woman got closer to me, stretching out her grotesque neck. She looked as if she had been choked. That's when it hit me. Her neck hurt like mine. My pain was her pain. It was unnatural. Did you die here? It nodded, heaving dry, silent sobs. Understanding, I looked to the door. I think I know what will help. Will you help me if it does? It nodded, and I motioned for it to follow me, follow me out the front door and open it. Outside, I coughed lightly. You'll breathe better outside and be free. It lingered and watched me in pain before understanding and nodding again. As she moved past me, my nostrils began to clear, As she walked over the doorstep, my sore throat began to subside, and as she exited, I could breathe again. She stopped at the front steps and extended her neck, looking up at the sky, extending it and breathing into the night air. She looked back at me. Thank you, she said and faded away. A cold gust of wind blew and I went back inside. Mom, Dad, I could speak. I shouted to them, and they woke up. They weren't sure how they got on the ground, but they both remembered the hovering, crane-necked woman above them, sapping their strength, trying to soothe her long, stretched, sore throat. They wondered if she had been real. She died in the house, but I freed her, and she gave me back my voice. I don't have to feel her pain anymore, I said, and they hugged me. Relieved that I could speak again. The Nancy in this story was named after one of our patrons, Nancy Martinez. Thank you for your patronage, Nancy. And thank you, Luna Rose, for submitting this story. 
It's interesting sometimes we think that every ghost story will be about ghosts meaning to do us harm. And sometimes it's simply a misunderstanding and they're just trying to get better on their own. Studying abroad is a dream for many. But what if it turned into a nightmare you can never return from? Like in this story, inspired by Madison. Just before my foreign exchange stay came to a close in Osaka, Japan, my housemate Emilio and I attended the big farewell celebration for our program. There was a strange feeling in the air as we toasted and played games in the recreation room with the others. Everyone was gathered from around the world, and we were having one last night in a place that had become like a second home. Amelia and I were the last two to stay in the boarding house as the others had closer flights. We were both going to fly to North and South America, respectively. Our program leader, Talk, would stay overnight with us in the empty building. Without the bustle and energy of the others, that strange empty feeling grew stronger, almost like it was a presence. As Emilio and I sorted our things, the light outside the building went dark. And that's when we saw it. We saw a figure stretched out that looked eight feet tall, wandering in the snow beyond the window. As it got close, it got taller and we heard the sound, this sound that boomed and boomed and boomed over and over again. This long thing looked at us from the window. It had a straw hat, sunken black eyes and long black hair. We screamed for Tak and pointed at the figure waiting outside. He saw it, he saw it too. It was the Hachi Shakusama. It's seen us. We have to hide overnight. Gathering some bowls and salt, Tok took us into the shared dorm room and prepared a fire. Tok had always been good under pressure and surprisingly enough was ready to fight this evil. Tok explained, I have heard of this, and once the Hachi Shakusama has seen us, it will wait for us to come out and claim our souls. We must stay inside overnight and make it until the rising sun. He placed the bowls of salt in every corner of the room. This salt serves as a barrier it can't cross, but do not leave it, or it is sense where you are and take you. You have to wait all night and leave this place for good. If you return, then it will find you. We had to stay in the room. Morbidly curious, Emilio peeked out the window and jumped back. There's another one. Tak and I looked outside, and yes, another stretched out figure was approaching. As it approached, it became taller and taller, and again that noise. Boom after boom after boom, all throughout the empty house. A chorus of voices cried out from the front doors below us. It sounded like the other students crying out for help. That broke talk, and he ran down to bring them inside. Emilio and I waited hours for talk to return. He must have barricaded them in another room, I figured. Worn out, we eventually slept for a while. Just before dawn, there was a sound coming from downstairs, a rattling as the booms echoed, but this time, further and further and further away. It's all clear now, Takashi yelled, and Emilio swung the dormitory room open. When he stepped out, two pairs of hands gripped him, dragging him out into the hall, ripping him asunder. With a shout, I slammed the door shut and retreated deep back into the room as the Hachishaku-sama waited outside of it. I looked, terrified, out the window, waiting as the sun rose. Exhausted out of my mind, I still kept my eyes open until my shuttle pulled into the driveway and honked for me and Emilio. Taking a deep breath, I opened the door. 
all traces of Emilio's body were gone. And as I wandered the empty house, I realized there was no one else. No other students, no Tak, and no Hachishaku-sama. I boarded the shuttle with my things and told the driver, it was just me. I have never returned to Japan ever again. Those that are veterans of the Something Scary podcast know that we've had another story with a Hachi Shakusama, very different. These local legends that exist when you're traveling abroad, they come from a place of truth. I personally haven't run across the Hachi Shakusama, but I will listen out for them. The wheels on the bus go round and round, but in this story inspired by Gabby, there is also a dark passenger on board. It was just before dawn as I watched the children slowly trickle into the bus. Two boys arrived early and they didn't see me, just like the others hadn't seen me. So I waited in the dark in the back of the bus. Out loud, they wondered where the driver went and where two of their classmates were, the two siblings who were always here first. How odd of them, I chuckled, as a few more children joined, a lovely gaggle of girls chatting away near the front of the bus, skittering my arms on the floors in the dark away from the light of the sun. I crept closer the dark passenger on this bus. I love it when they're unsuspecting. One of the boys dropped a pencil and I caught it in my teeth, smiling up at them as they saw my face. I don't know what it is about my face, but children freeze and can't move. Quickly, with a great suction, I absorbed the boy before his friend could notice. He'd gotten up to ask the girls if they'd seen the bus driver. I crouched back down with my back to the seat, a head like a fly to the wall. I popped my eyes onto my fingers and tapped them onto the side to look at the children. Oh, goody. There were more coming in. They talked amongst themselves, more worried now than they should be. A name was called. Perhaps it was the boy I had eaten. And when no response was given... Their worry grew. There is something in the back of the bus, one of the boys said. And everyone laughed, making fun of him and jeering, going back to their business. Alone, he approached the back of the bus, calling his friend's name out. I put on his friend's backpack and faced the window. There was a tap on my shoulder It was the boy. He froze as I stared him in the face and once more absorbed his life with a poof and he disappeared into my body, terrified and tasty. As more kids got on the bus, they became more restless. I slowly hunted them one by one. The girls complained that the boys were trying to prank them by hiding in the back. They didn't realize but they would know. Giddy and excited, enjoying my morning breakfast. My arms glided and stretched on the ground beneath them to turn on the bus ignition and shut the doors. The driverless bus moved forward and their little screams made my bottomless stomach rumble. Locked inside with me, I stood towering over them, stretching my face wide and arms dangling as I made my way down every row, all of them quivering in fear. My favorite is when they cry for their parents as I snatch them up one by one to gobble them down, each one more scared than the last, making them tastier as I made my way down to the front to the two girls huddled together in the first row. How sweet. They didn't even let go of each other and made for the most delicious and delectable double treat. Now the bus is empty and they are all gone, stopping the bus at the next stop. 
and another feast of children piled in as my hunger raged on, and they'd never get to go home again. This week's podcast stories were edited by Kyle Arrington, Marquia McCarty, and Sabina Graves. Audio edited by Johnny Ashley and Fitz Harris. Produced by Annalise Nelson. Music by Sapphire Sandalo. If you have a story you'd like to submit, send me an email at somethingscary@snarl.com. Don't forget to watch the video version of Something Scary over at youtube.com slash snarled. And if you'd like to support the show and receive bonus content, join our Patreon at patreon.com slash snarled. Until next time, my dark darlings, sweet dreams. <laughs>